After a strange night in the city, many, many people are dead. A biker bar is stuffed with bullet-riddled corpses of Hell's Angels. In the city aquarium, several workers and a night guard float dead in a huge tank, being picked at by triggerfish and sharks. At a construction site, several men stand frozen, their faces locked in forever grimaces of anguish. Just outside town, the bodies of two police officers lay scorched beyond recognition, and even further out, the body of an old farmer hangs from the twisted wire of a fence. What could possibly be behind this town-wide carnage? How could one being be the cause of so much death? To find out, we need only rewind a few hours. 6 p.m. Nobody has any idea of the horrors the night has in store for them. But if they knew about one another, they might have some idea of the clues, the little signs that point to something being just a bit… off. Over in the biker bar, the big, tough, leather-clad men, their hair tied back with bandanas and their beards twisted into Viking locks, laugh and shoot pool together. They've completed some good scores lately. Nobody messes with them. They own these streets. It's their strength, their intimidation, and most important of all, the cache of guns in the back of the bar. One biker among them hears something strange, though, something rustling in the back room. Has someone infiltrated the armory? He pulls out his side piece, a revolver with a pearlescent handle, and barges into the armory. But the room is empty, not just of people, but of weapons. All the gun racks are laid bare, his heart drops into his stomach. Seconds later, he's running back into the bar, demanding that the music be shut off. He sounds the alarm, and bikers start scrambling, as though the missing guns might be hiding under the tables. Little do they know that the truth is far, far stranger. Over at the city aquarium, they're wrapping up for the day, seeing off their remaining few customers. Janitors are starting their nightly rounds as night guards suit up and prep for patrol. One more marine biologist who works full-time studying the aquarium's many creatures isn't quite ready to go home for the night. She's made herself a new pot of coffee and is on her way to the octopus tank, containing several of the hyper-intelligent, mysterious mollusks. But when she arrives, she sees a startling sight. All the octopi are gone. Shocked and horrified, she calls over some janitors and a night guard. There are a few other possibilities. Either these slimy escape artists had figured out a way to get out and slither away, or someone had stolen them. She's in a full panic now. These octopi are vital to her research. But when the others arrive, there's no trace of the creatures. There is, however, a strange pair of tiny, wet footsteps heading towards the tank. Before any of them can react to that, they hear a wet slapping sound behind them. Over at a construction site, work is just ramping up. Plans are being drawn up for the night's work, and construction equipment is being vanned in. The foreman of the construction site is pleased with how everything is progressing, and if everyone does their job right, they'll have all their work completed on schedule. He lives in this state of blissful optimism until one of his workers runs over to him in a panic. Someone has stolen four bags of cement, the exact four bags of cement they need for setting the foundation. As the foreman calls the company manager to profusely apologize for the delays, the construction workers scramble around the site, looking anywhere they can for the four bags. It's not uncommon for equipment to get stolen from construction sites, but bags of cement? That's strange. Though not nearly as strange as the creature approaching the foreman, step by careful step, its hard gray skin scratching against itself. Meanwhile, a pair of police officers in a squad car receive a call over the radio. There are reports of a break-in at a nuclear graveyard across town, a large stone dome covering up a mess of radioactive material from when the city used to have a nuclear power plant. Someone tripped the alarm on the perimeter gate, and someone needs to get there and apprehend the intruder before they do something they seriously regret. The officers arrive not so long after and see a hole cut into the fence, but the hole is weirdly low and small. Was the person who broke in a small child? That's even more reason to hurry. The two officers pull out their flashlights and head up to the gate, opening it and walking through. Just as they're starting to wonder whether they should have brought some kind of radiation guard, they feel a strange, warm sensation on their skin, like a tanning bed, like blistering sunlight in the middle of the night. They turn and try to see what's walking towards them. The air seems to distort and wobble, even in the dark. Then there's a flash of bright, eye-searing light, and both the officers scream. On a farm nestled in the sticks outside the town, an old farmer is carrying out his twilight rounds. 
He's hammering in fence posts, making sure the sheep, cows, and chickens are fenced off. He's about to turn in for the night when he sees a goat, his goat, wandering out in the fields beyond his own. He doesn't know how this thing escaped, but in any case, he needs to get it back. As he walks to the edge of the farm, he finds out why. Someone has ripped away all the barbed wire from a section of the outer fence. The wire is completely gone. It doesn't make sense. His mind fills with questions, and one awful, monstrous answer is standing right behind him. Then, all across town, the chaos begins. Back in the biker bar, there's a quiet tapping amidst the chaos of heavy leather boots tromping back and forth. The tap, tap, tap of metal against wooden floorboards. The bikers turn in unison to the back of the bar, where something small and squat is limping out of the shadows. When it steps into the light, the bikers can hardly believe what they're seeing. It's a teddy bear, a living, walking teddy bear, made out of guns. Its body is an amalgam of stocks and ammo belts. It walks on a pair of spindly rifle barrels for legs. Its eyes are scopes and laser sights. And perhaps most striking are its arms. The left arm is an Uzi submachine gun, and the right is an AA-12 fully automatic drum barrel shotgun. The bikers recognize every gun as their own. But before their many minds can compute another thought, the gun bear raises its shotgun and Uzi arms and begins blasting. Bullet after bullet tears through the bikers, dropping them one by one. Some scramble for the door, but it doesn't save them. In a matter of moments, as gunshots ring throughout the bar, every single biker is dead. Over at the aquarium, things aren't going much better. The marine biologist and her co-workers turn to see a strange figure standing on top the tank. It's in the shape of a teddy bear, but the biologist can clearly see that it's about five octopi fused together in some nightmarish and unnatural conglomeration. The tentacles stretch out and grab the aquarium staff, lifting them with impossible strength and force them down into the tank. They struggle and thrash against the slimy tentacles holding them in place underwater, but it's no use. The octopi bear is in total control. Bubbles rise as the unfortunate aquarium staff struggle, but those bubbles eventually stop. Everyone in the tank floats, dead. The work of the octopi bear isn't over yet, though. It drags the waterlogged corpses of the marine biologist, the cleaners, and the night guard across the aquarium floor, leaving a wet trail. Eventually, it throws the bodies into the main aquarium tank and watches with a slimy, blank expression as the fish begin to feed. Back at the construction site, the workers are frozen, but not in fear. The entity that stepped out of the shadows of the construction site is a teddy bear made of solid cement, constructed out of the four stolen bags. The second the foreman saw it, he called in the other workers to see, dooming them to share his fate. As some of them reach into their jackets to grab phones, eager to take photos, just to see if this truly is happening, the cement teddy bear screams. It's an awful sound, the screech of metal on metal, like a broken cement mixer spinning off kilter and threatening to explode. But it doesn't explode, it just keeps screeching. And as it screeches, the workers and the foreman are frozen in place. As much as they try with all their might, it's like their bodies are turning into concrete, no, it isn't like that at all. That's exactly what's happening. Their skin is taking on a slate gray hue, becoming rigid and brittle. Little by little, their bodies freeze and harden. Their eyes go after all the rest as they watch themselves becoming living statues trapped forever in the shell of their own bodies. The cement teddy bear walks among them and it begins to dance. Over at the nuclear graveyard, another two corpses are about to be interred. That flash of light is actually a localized blast of radiation that would make Chernobyl look positively quaint, frying the officers on a cellular level in less time than it would take for a camera to take a photograph. They lay on the ground, skin burnt, vomiting profusely. They twitch and squirm, not quite dead, but trapped in a void of unimaginable pain. Every thought burned out of their head. Their killer walks towards them on tiny, flat feet. As you may have predicted, it's a teddy bear, a living, walking teddy bear cobbled together out of radioactive material. What it's done to the two police officers is horrifying, but if it gets into the city proper, the death toll will quickly climb into the thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands. But the violence and terror of the night is not quite over yet. We return to the farm 
where a farmer can only just make out a tiny figure stomping across the grass towards him. He hears it before he sees it and whips around, the strange jangling of metal against metal. He immediately regrets not bringing his gun, but it's too late for regrets now. He can see it now, the freakish little teddy bear made out of twisted barbed wire. Tendrils of the wire strip away from the teddy bear's body and launch towards him like angry vipers. They wrap around his body and limbs around his neck and tie him to a fence post. He tries to struggle, but every movement hurts as more barbed wire cocoons him. Out on the field, the goat looks on with complete indifference. What you just witnessed is a series of horrifying impossibilities. Unless, of course, you are dealing with SCP-1048, a singularly strange anomaly known as the Builder Bear. But please don't let the apparent whimsy of that name fool you. What we're dealing with here is an extremely dangerous Keter-class anomaly. But before we get there, we need to explore some background information on the entity before it revealed its darker side. SCP-1048 is a relatively small and unassuming teddy bear, standing at only 33 centimeters tall. Researchers have studied the materials and composition behind the Builder Bear and found that nothing about it is inherently anomalous. But despite this, the bear appears to be fully sapient and capable of moving of its own accord. While it is incapable of speech, it can communicate through some small gestures, all of which are extremely sweet and affectionate. Yes, you heard that correctly. One of the most surprising things about SCP-1048, if you're only familiar with it by reputation, is the fact that most people who directly encounter it find it endearing and even adorable. It shows affection to human subjects by hugging their lower leg, dancing, jumping in place, and even drawing childlike crayon pictures for Foundation janitorial staff. Before the darker incidents began, almost everyone reported positive feelings towards SCP-1048. Even D-Class personnel who had tested positive for sociopathic tendencies. Despite its seemingly charming exterior, the inner workings of the Builder Bear's mind still remain a mystery. Attempts to communicate with the anomaly directly have failed, because although it is capable of making simple gestures indicating yes and no answers, it will often simply ignore certain questions. Specifically, it will completely stonewall any questions about its origins, which is partly why the Foundation knows so little except for what it can directly observe. Whether the Builder Bear declines to answer because it doesn't know, or because it doesn't want to share, is an open question. And while the Builder Bear is capable of drawing pictures, these are purely for the aesthetic value of the pictures themselves, not a means of communication. It's yet another mystery for the enigmatic bear. Seven months after first being contained in Site-24, Foundation personnel were able to first observe the Builder Bear's secondary anomalous effect, the one that gave it its namesake. Its ability to create crude living replicas of itself from various materials. This would be fine and dandy, if not for the fact that these replicas are invariably extremely hostile and dangerous. Dr. Carver, the head researcher on the SCP-1048 case, posited that, in hindsight, the reason that the Builder Bear behaved so affectionately to staff around Site-24 was to lull its victims into a false sense of security, making it easier to collect materials for its secondary anomalous pursuits. Dr. Carver outlined case studies of the three most dangerous SCP-1048 creations that have manifested in Site-24 since the Builder Bear started its grim construction project. These creations have been labeled SCP-1048-A, SCP-1048-B, and SCP-1048-C. I'd like to personally warn you that the accounts of these three devious bears are disturbing beyond belief, even by the standards of anomalies studied by the SCP Foundation. During the first incident, SCP-1048 was spotted walking with SCP-1048-A down a hallway in Site-24. 1048-A is similar to its creator in size and shape, except that it's made entirely from human ears. Dr. Carver was immediately alerted to the creature's presence, and he dispatched a security team to apprehend both anomalies. However, what seemed like what would be a simple mission instead became a nightmarish case of mass death. As soon as the security team surrounded the two bears, 1048-A let out an impossibly loud, ear-piercing shriek that induced physical pain in everyone within a 10-meter range. But we're not just talking about hearing loss here. Everyone within hearing range began collapsing, growing ears all over their body, covering every inch of their skin. The two bears managed to escape during the chaos, and Dr. Carver arrived just too late to make any difference. 
though luckily for him, he was at least able to avoid becoming an earbomination. This incident resulted in personnel deaths in the double digits, the cause of death mainly suffocation from all the ears that had grown in the throats and lungs of all those affected. 1048A has still not been contained. While 1048A was hardly a walk in the park, 1048B was, in this humble scientist's opinion, considerably more revolting. I will have to tread carefully here, as the creation of 1048B is an extremely traumatic incident for an active duty member of Foundation personnel who still works at Site 24 to this day. In order to remain within the bounds of good taste, we'll say that 1048B looks like a frightening cross between a plush teddy bear and a human infant. Before the creation of 1048B, the anonymous researcher I mentioned earlier was heavily pregnant. Afterwards, she was not. The less said about that, the better. Moving on. The third of the documented SCP-1048 creations is perhaps even more frightening and dangerous than the other two. 1048C was first spotted by Dr. Carver himself, lurking in his office. 1048C is another living teddy bear, made entirely from rusted scrap metal and jagged blades. The second that Dr. Carver spotted the metal monster, it got away fatally slicing and dicing its way through a number of Site-24 guards during its escape. Like the other two, it has not been sighted since the incident and is presumed to be still active somewhere in Site-24, potentially ready to pop out at any moment. It brings a whole new meaning to the term bad news bears. Those well-versed in the anomalous files of the SCP Foundation may be feeling a strange flicker of memory right now. That's because SCP-1048 isn't the only anomalous teddy bear out there, and its counterpart, SCP-2295, the bear with the heart of patchwork, seems to be its perfect opposite in terms of temperament. It goes without saying that SCP-1048 and its terrifying copies are a menace to everyone it encounters, but the bear with the heart of patchwork endeavors to save injured human beings whenever it can. If this benevolent bear discovers a person with a severe injury or a disease causing organ failure, it will immediately leap into action. Like a cuddly trauma surgeon, SCP-2295 will take a needle and thread and begin making a fully functional plush organ out of its own material. It will then attempt to perform transplant surgery, and if the surgery is successful, this patchwork organ will function exactly as a regular one. The bear has saved many lives like this. In fact, SCP-2295 is so benevolent that in cases where the surgery fails, it's been witnessed doubled over and crying over the loss of life. This is a courtesy that you cannot expect if your life is brought to an abrupt demise by one of SCP-1048's many copies. The containment procedures for SCP-1048 have undergone considerable evolution as the Foundation learned more about the entity's anomalous effects. Originally classified as safe before its secondary characteristics manifested, the anomaly is now classified as Keter. Its original containment procedures are also shockingly lax given what we know now. 1048 was given free reign to wander around Site-24 and interact with personnel to its heart's content, a policy that we now know had terrible consequences. Technically speaking, SCP-1048 isn't contained. Many believe that it still lurks somewhere inside Site-24, though nobody can know this for sure. The orders for all active Foundation personnel is to apprehend SCP-1048 on site and to immediately destroy any of its deadly creations with extreme prejudice. The dangers posed by SCP-1048 are so great that even non-anomalous teddy bears are banned from Site-24 to prevent any potential confusion. Any object resembling a bear is to be reported to the site security team to avoid a potential mass casualty event. Dr. Carver appended a note to SCP-1048's containment procedures saying, This is not a joke. We have no idea what SCP-1048's full capabilities are. Who knows how many of the damn things are out there by now? It's a disquieting thought, to say the least. The Builder Bear is one of the most peculiar and dangerous self-perpetuating anomalies out there, with incredibly unpredictable abilities across its different iterations. If you want to stay safe, my recommendation is to be wary of any stuffed bears you may see lying around. If you're lucky, it's just another adorable plush creature. If you're unlucky, well, I hope you've made all the proper arrangements. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today.
Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-4966, Tabioka, Devourer of Souls, Consumer of Secrets, Lord of Munchies.